Welcome, everyone. I'm Calvin French Owen, CTO and co founder of Segment. And today, I'd like to share a few of the things that we've been up to at Segment. Now, I'd like to start off by highlighting the elephant in the room. Today, you're making a hard choice. You have to pick between the three big cloud providers in terms of choosing where to build your infrastructure. You pick Amazon, thought to be the market leader. You could pick Microsoft, thought to have the best enterprise solutions. Or you could pick, Am or, sorry, you could pick Google, thought to have the best technology. Now you know that when you make that choice, you're probably gonna be locked in by some amount of switching cost, and more likely than not, maybe a one to three year commit. And moreover, it's going to have lasting ramifications on things like the cost of your infrastructure, maybe your performance that you're able to get. Maybe it's even your ability to deliver a final product on time and under budget. Now at Segment, this was the position we found ourselves in about a year and a half ago. We were trying to deliver a new product, Personas, and we kept hitting the limits of what the Amazon infrastructure could do for us. So we started turning our attention to other options out on the table. And the ones we found were on Google Cloud. In particular, using two products, BigQuery and Bigtable, allowed us to build out our new product personas and deliver it to our users and create millions of dollars of revenue in a single year. Today, I'd like to lead you on a journey through personas its underlying architecture, and how we've leveraged these two different cloud products to deliver a fully finished product. I'm hoping that you can take some of the lessons away and apply them to your own infrastructure when it comes to building on top of Google Cloud. So let's dive in. As part of today's roadmap, I'd like to start out with a little bit of background. What is Segment? How does it work? Then we'll transition to the architecture of Personas itself how it's built, and what use cases it's designed to address before diving in deep to understand how it's built on top of both BigQuery and Bigtable. Finally, we'll revisit some of those hard choices that we've had to make in production ourselves and talk about some of the trade-offs that we see now and going forward. So a bit of background. What is Segment? What's the scale that we're seeing today? For those of you who might not be familiar, Segment gives you a single API to collect data about your users. These might be things like users loading pages on your website, maybe it's signing up via your mobile app, maybe it's completing orders on your online checkout. Whatever it is, your users are doing things with your app, and you want to know who they are and why they're doing the things that they're doing. Concretely, what that looks like is that Segment gives you the set of sources that you see on the left. These are places where your data lives whether it's your mobile app, website, or maybe a source like Stripe or Zendesk. We all take that data into one consistent place and then get it into hundreds of different SaaS tools that you might be using over on the right. These could be data warehouses like Redshift or BigQuery. Maybe it's an email tool like Customer.io or Zendesk. Or maybe it's an analytics tool like Google Analytics or Mixpanel. Whatever it is, Segment helps you get that single source of truth about your data into all of those different destinations. Now, by the numbers, this has taken us to some interesting places. Today, we collect data for 19,000 users every single month. And in terms of our intake, we process about 300 billion events every single month as well. That translates to roughly 450 billion outbound API calls that we're making and processing terabytes of data per day. Now, to date, all of this infrastructure has run on Amazon. It's running in Amazon's compute environment, and we're processing all of that data using ECS and a fleet of 16,000 containers. And under the hood, it looks something a little bit like this. We have our API at the front door, which is ingesting events. It's then publishing those to Kafka, which we use as our primary message bus, where we're collecting all of these different sorts of events. And then from there, we have a consumer who's reading each message, reading from a database and figuring out where that data should be sent, and then deciding to send that data to certain destinations. Maybe this event is bound for Google Analytics, this other one is built for Salesforce, 
Another one is even sent to Mixpanel. And maybe we have one which is supposed to go to all of the above. Now, there's a really big advantage of this system in the way that we've architected it. And that's that it's stateless. If we want to add more capacity to the system, it gives us more throughput. We can simply just double the amount of collection points, the amount of Kafka brokers, the amount of consumers. And really, the only shared thing here is our database. But maybe we can get past that with some read replicas and some caching. In our case, it's really easy to just scale out more capacity as our load doubles, triples, 10x's, or 50x's. It kind of doesn't matter. But in 2018, our product team started giving us a new set of requirements. And in particular, it was to launch this new product called Personas. The idea was to take Segment from this place which simply streamed individual events around, where each event maybe doesn't have any correlation to the others, to actually creating the idea of a user profile something that's a little more holistic who tells you what the user is and what they're doing. Hopefully it should tell you a little bit about who they are, where they've been, and allow you to query that in real time. Now, as you might guess, this use case is decidedly stateful. We can't any longer just add nodes to our infrastructure and expect them all to fan out and kind of work in this magical way. Instead, now we actually have to pull our data together and put it into one spot so that if we query it, we get a both consistent and available answer. To give you a better sense of what these staple use cases look like, let me walk you through the three use cases of personas. The first one is what we call the profile API. The general idea here is that we have some set of information about the user, who they are, what they've done. And we want to be able to pull that information programmatically. Now, there's two use cases which we found this for. The biggest one is for building personalization systems in your web app. Let's say you're running an online store. You sell all different types of pants, men's pants, women's pants, kids' pants. But if you've seen a user come back in the past 10 times in the last month, and they've only looked at men's pants, maybe you should change up your homepage. Make it guide them a little bit towards finding only men's pants so they don't have to click around and potentially abandon your entire checkout flow. The second use case, after pro the profile API for personalization, is around identity resolution. As I said before, we're collecting data from many different places. Maybe it's your web app. Maybe it's your mobile app. Maybe it's another source, like Zendesk or Stripe. Each of those users may get a different identity. Maybe it's their email. Maybe it's the ID that you have in your user database. Or maybe it's something else, like a Stripe customer ID. We want to be able to take those different individual identifiers and unify them so that if you want to query for a user, it doesn't matter if they're Calvin at segment or if they're XYZ123 or Stripe, some other CUS underscore whatever. We want to be able to say, here's Calvin, here's my user. And finally, the third use case after the profile API and identity resolution is audience computation. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar, and I certainly wasn't when I, we first started Segment, an audience is just a group of people who meet certain criteria. You want to be able to specify certain rules to say, hey, which of my users have visited three times in the past month, started a checkout flow last week, but then never completed it? Personas gives you this ability to create those arbitrary rules and then find that list of users. So that's personas. You can query users in real time via the profile API, match them by identity, and then create audiences of users as well. Let's take a look at how it's architected under the hood. Now, I wanted to start by first talking about Lambda architectures. And don't worry, I'm at the right conference. Uh, this is a different type of Lambda architecture than the serverless one you might be hearing about. Now, this Lambda architecture actually comes from this guy, Nathan Martz, uh, who was at Twitter. And he kept coming up with these concepts of how he could process lots and lots of data in real time. And he wanted to ensure that he could crunch both large amounts of data, potentially terabytes or petabytes, but also get a good real-time view of individual uh, parts of analysis that he was running. And so he came up with a system that you see behind me. The general idea is that new data comes in via a single source, but then it's written twice. First, it's written to a batch layer. 
some sort of job that's running maybe hourly or daily is doing big rollups and aggregations of a bunch of different pieces of data. From there, he also writes data to what he calls a speed layer. You could think of this as being something like Kafka or the queue that we've been keeping track of. This effectively has the diff of whatever the batch layer has. Then at query time, you effectively want to pull those two pieces together. You can grab your big aggregation that you have, as well as your little real-time updates that you've been making. Now, if you look at this, we have a few different use cases here. We have batch computations, we have speed to get us the best of both worlds in terms of aggregation and in terms of real-time updates. It actually doesn't look that different from what we want on personas. We want to be able to query our profiles in real time and match users by identity. And we want those actions to happen incredibly quickly, ideally under a second. But we also want to create audiences of users. And this is where we scan terabytes of data. And maybe it's OK if it takes a few minutes uh, or maybe even an hour to come back. Now, you might be thinking, well, it sounds like you have different pipelines with different requirements. Why not use different data stores? And that's exactly what we did. We effectively have our single message bus in Kafka, then publishing to Cloud PubSub. And from there, we have two separate sets of workers who are writing the data twice. One set of workers is writing that data into BigQuery to do batch processing to create those audiences. The second set of workers are writing into Bigtable to give us real-time results and updates. I'm going to start on the left-hand side of this diagram before moving into the right to really explore some of these use cases. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, Kafka and PubSub both are this kind of idea of a message bus. Each one can take individual messages and then replicate them for delivery. To give you a better sense of what segment messages actually look like, I've included an example over here on the right. Segment messages involve tracking things like page views, user events, maybe it's completed order events, whatever it is. Here I just took an example from my blog. Typically, these are semi-structured JSON. So segment, as part of our API spec, we specify that there are a few top-level fields that you need. These would be things like the user ID, the event name, uh, maybe a timestamp to let us know when the event happened. But the rest is all filled in by our customers, depending on what's important to them. So for example, here, you could see that there are a few custom properties. Maybe it's the name of the article. Maybe it's the refer. If you're running a music app, maybe it's something like the song title or the artist. Whatever it is, we can't really anticipate it ahead of time. It's just our users sending it into our API. So that's a key part of our data processing pipeline. And typically, these messages run to about one kilobyte in terms of average, though they may span up to 32 kilobytes, depending on how much stuff is just packed into that message. To give you a sense of what this actually looks like from a code perspective, I have included basically a light version of the code that takes data from Kafka and publishes it into PubSub. Effectively, we iterate over a range of messages here. We create a payload of them, tagging each message with its type and collection, basically what sort of thing it is whether it's a user, product, or an account. We pack that all into JSON, and then we compress it via Snappy. And then we ship it off to PubSub. And from there, we're trying to analyze these hundreds of thousands of one kilobyte messages, where for one branch, we send it into our batch computations in BigQuery. And for the second branch, we send into the real-time computations in Bigtable. So let's dive into each of those, BigQuery and Cloud Bigtable. For each one, I'd like to compare them first on the use case that we're trying to achieve, second, the underlying architecture pulled from the best of my understanding from white papers and papers that are published externally by Google, third, we'll talk about their data model, what it actually looks like to store segment data in these systems, and then fourth, we'll discuss the query patterns, how we're actually using this in production. So let's revisit this use case. On the top here, we have the worker, which is running and loading data into BigQuery. And because this is a batch job, we can run it, let's say, every 15 minutes or kind of whatever schedule we want. Separately, we're running and then computing this data via the compute service 
which is effectively just running a cron job to calculate audiences for our users every so many minutes. And again, we want to find users who meet arbitrary criteria here. We don't know what those criteria are ahead of time. It's up to our users to specify them. We have terabytes of data sitting in the system, and we need to get responses within a few minutes. But it doesn't have to be seconds, milliseconds, nanoseconds. We rarely care about all of the columns, which is pretty key. Oftentimes, we'll be only trying to say, hey, who are users who have done event X more than Y times? Or maybe find me only users in San Francisco. In this case, we're picking one tiny part of our information and then extracting a list of user IDs. And again, real-time reads are not a big deal here. We need maybe only tens of concurrent queries to satisfy our user base. And so as long as we're able to get that, we're good. So let's look at what BigQuery looks like under the hood. Now I'm going to do a quick history lesson here. Internally at Google, there have been a number of systems for crunching large amounts of data. And back in 2004, kind of the seminal paper on this was called MapReduce. And at the time, Google was trying to compute basically the entire index of the web. Uh, sounds like a small goal, right? And so with MapReduce, they said, hey, we want to be able to crawl the entire web, and we want to be able to figure out page rank for each of these pages. We want to be able to say which pages are the most popular based upon which pages then link to them. And so MapReduce was this internal system that Google had where, as the programmer, you needed to write two functions. You needed to write a map function and a reduce function. And as long as you specified those two things and then passed in your data set, you'd be able to get your results back within maybe hours or maybe the next day. But it was the best thing that they had for literally web scale data at the time, so they used it. And they were able to parse a lot of freeform text. But then in 2010, a new paper came out called Dremel. And this is really the basis for a BigQuery. Now, in the paper, they say that this has actually been put around since 2006. But Dremel was designed to solve a different set of problems than MapReduce. In particular, it was designed for interactive analysis. Now, you can think of Dremel as sort of being the internal version of BigQuery. But in terms of how they're set up, my understanding is that we're roughly the same. For BigQuery and Dremel, that interactive piece is key. Now, instead of being an analyst who had to wait hours or maybe overnight to get back your results, you could just get them within a few minutes. So if you were exploring your data, it could actually give you a really good sense of what was in it. The other big advantage of Dremel and BigQuery was that it used SQL rather than programming. Before, you might end up writing a big MapReduce job saying, yes, this looks great, and then you ship it off to whatever your MapReduce or maybe externally a Hadoop cluster looks like. And then when you come back, it turns out some part of your program had errored, which means that you have to run the entire thing again. Because BigQuery and Dremel use SQL, it meant that it was accessible to your average analyst and could get you back data uh, as well as errors in a very, very quick time scale. Additionally, it uses nested structured data, which I'll talk about a little bit more here, rather than the freeform text that MapReduce just says, OK, you have some sort of input of bytes and output. In particular, I'd like to highlight four good ideas that are all pulled from the Dremel and BigQuery paper. And these are all ideas that we've used to successfully scan terabytes of data within a few minutes. The first idea is being column-oriented. And let me talk more about what this means. Suppose we want to build a database. We want to create something where I can add data to it, I can query it, and I know that that data is somehow written durably. How might we do it? Well, let's assume we're doing the dead simple thing here. And I'm just adding to a flat file where each row involves a new row in my database or a new record. Maybe first I have the name of the engineer on my team. Maybe I have their job position. Maybe I have how many contributions they've had in the last year. And then maybe I have their location. And on the face of this, this kind of looks like a standard database, right? It's like, if I want more rows, I can add them to the end. If I update, I could update in place. Or I could potentially add to the end and merge later. Uh, it just seems like it does what I want, just as a flat file. But now let's get back to our problem statement. 
what if my database has billions of rows and I only need one of them? What if I only need the location data, for example? Remember, we want to be able to scan all this data incredibly quickly. Well, the good idea that BigQuery had is, hey, let's store columns, not rows. If we look back at my super simple database example here, instead of storing a single file with each row indicating a record, let's instead split them up. Let's keep one file for each column. Then if I want to grab the location itself, it's easy. I just read the location file. And now I don't have to parse through all of this unnecessary data that maybe I don't care about for things like the person's name or their role or how many contributions they've had. I don't have to split those commas, do all that CSV processing. Instead, I just get what I want. And under the hood, it turns out that BigQuery and Dremel do the same exact thing. Instead of storing rows as records, or records as rows, rather, uh, they keep columns which individual nodes can store. So if you only need to grab one thing, you can just scan super quickly, and then you get your result back. The second good idea is actually related to being column-oriented, and that's using compression. As you might have noticed, if I have all of these columns on disk, San Francisco, San Francisco, Tokyo, San Francisco, San Francisco, we have a lot of repeated data here. And in particular, if I need to scan all of that data on disk, or if it's from a backing data file store, I need to do a lot of network transfer costs, as well as just raw seeking of the data itself. So instead, we can compress it by using something uh, like run length encoding. The general idea here is that, let's say I have 200 entries which all have San Francisco as the entry. I can now encode them and say San Francisco 200 before reading the next column, which maybe is Tokyo 1, and then maybe I have another San Francisco 100. In practice, when I have a really, really big data set, this makes scanning it and parsing it much, much quicker. So we have column-oriented and compression. The third idea that I'd like to touch on is an efficient nested encoding. And I'll get back to why this is important uh, in a few minutes. But to give you a sense of what exactly this is, BigQuery gives you the ability to specify what your data looks like. Here, it's represented as protobufs, which is a technology that we also use internally at Segment. Instead of storing all of that data and serializing it as JSON or some other format, BigQuery actually keeps this idea of a field column and a depth column, which let you know if you're parsing that data, whether you're still in the same field or not. And honestly, this goes into more depth than I'm able to share during this quick talk. But to give you an example, here's what happens when you select all of your fields. BigQuery will actually generate a finite state machine, which figures out, depending on what that record field and depth field are, how it should traverse your document. And then from there, it actually pulls apart that finite state machine to parse it into its own structs or protobufs or whatever it is. This makes sure that if you're parsing billions of records, you can do it extremely quickly without having a lot of overhead of trying to figure out sizing and allocations for those results. So we had a bunch of tactics for making scanning on an individual machine much quicker. The last one I'd like to share is this idea of adding servers to increase efficiency. Obviously, if we're querying these terabyte data sets on Google Cloud hardware, it's much different than if those data sets are just running on my laptop within my own little database. Now, BigQuery makes use of this same idea. Effectively, if you're a client, you take data, or at first you hit the root server and you submit your query, and then there's a set of intermediate servers, which are basically figuring out how to fan out that query to individual leaf nodes, where each of those leaf nodes then does only a small subset of the work and passes back the results. To get an example of what this looks like, let's say you're querying the root node. And maybe for this example, you have just one single layer in our tree. If we get our responses back, that root node officially has to merge all of our data, which could potentially be a lot. Instead, as is discussed in the paper and is this technique that's used behind the hood, what ends up happening is there are different layers which each individually split up the work. So now if we issue a query, there are a bunch of intermediate merges that happen. 
So each node has to deal with much, much smaller data set. The great thing here is that more servers effectively means more distributed work. And the fact that it's running in this giant multi-tenant system that's been in place at Google for the past 10 years means that we have a pretty good confidence that those servers are doing a lot of shared computation and getting good utilization. So those are big queries for good ideas. Being column oriented, compressing data so it's read quickly from a single node, using a fast nested data encoding, which also supports arrays and nested objects, and distributing the work, especially by separating data and compute. Let's look at how that data model now maps into personas and how nuts to bolts we're using BigQuery. Remember, as I said before, we want to allow users to create custom audiences. These are just groups of users who meet certain criteria. We effectively want to take this criteria and turn it into more or less a SQL query with custom parameters. But how we do this could be t difficult, right? It's like we have this kind of custom UI, and if we add new features to it, we don't want to then have to be building a bunch of stuff on the back end to translate it. So what we do is we convert it to an intermediate format. We convert it into JSON as part of an abstract syntax tree. And then from there, we actually convert that AST into raw SQL. It's all machine generated, but to our user, it gives them this nice interface that meets them on their level, while for us, it gives us the power and flexibility of SQL on the back end. In terms of how we're actually storing this data, we keep a data set per customer to provide isolation and better monitoring across them. And then we keep a table per each collection and event. Remember, a collection is just a type of thing, whether it's a user, account, or product. Additionally, we keep tables for things like traits, identity, and merging. And in particular, I want to call your attention to this set of external IDs. This is the nested, repeated format that BigQuery allows. And it's one that you won't find in a lot of other data warehouses or big data stores. The fact that this allows us to specify multiple external IDs whether it's an email, or whether it's a database ID, or whether it's a Stripe ID, means that if we qu want to query for any one of those, we can, and we can be sure that it's quickly findable and indexed, and that we're not spending a bunch of time parsing JSON or trying to dig into these objects. It's right there as a top-level field. Additionally, we end up exploding all of these properties that the user passes in. In our V1, we actually stored these specifically as JSON and kind of in its own field. What we found is that we actually got much better performance by exploding them out, doing the alterations of the table when we're uploading that data, and making sure that we're able to query it quickly and efficiently. So let's look at the query patterns. How's this being used in production? Remember, this is the job of the compute service. The compute service is sending data, or sending queries across a handful at a time, and it's trying to run those as an aggregate, as sort of a cron job. Maybe every few minutes it's saying, okay, what's new with this audience for customer A? What's new with this audience for customer B? What's new with this audience for customer C? What this looks like under the hood, and I grabbed a few queries from our production account, is that this is creating these tens of queries per second, which honestly look like garbage. And it's because it's all machine generated. At the end of the day, we don't care about what these queries look like. We only care that our customers are able to have flexibility when it comes to querying those different data sets. And in terms of actual query times, we see good performance as well. We're able to query gigabytes or terabytes in a matter of seconds or minutes. Additionally, this gives our users the ability to preview particular users who might fall into this audience because they're able to interactively query so they can check and see, hey, did the audience I built actually work out properly? And we also give them insights about potentially overlapping audiences that they might have, areas where user IDs might also fall into this audience. Looking at our numbers in production by today, we're currently scanning about two gigabytes every single second, which corresponds to about 170 terabytes a day, and we're using about 800 slots. So that roughly wraps up our BigQuery section. We run our batch computations here for tens of concurrent queries. We're partitioning it by customer so we get good visibility and isolation across them. 
And we end up keeping these repeated arrays of external IDs. So that if we want to query by a particular ID, we can. Let's shift gears to the speed side of the equation now. Remember, we want to be able to query for this profile API. In this case, we can't get data that's minutes or hours old, right? But we also don't care about querying for data across all of our users. Instead, we want to get data in real time for the specific user when they're on the web page. And that takes this bottom path, the speed layer. The use cases here are much different. Instead of having to crunch our gigabytes or terabytes worth of data across all users, now we're simply looking at kilobytes to megabytes of data. We want to primarily index it based upon user and then maybe to a second extent time. And we need a high read and write rate. We're potentially doing tens of thousands of queries per second here. And again, data should be reflected in real time. We want this to happen in under 300 to 500 milliseconds. Now what's interesting when I was reading the Bigtable paper is that this is actually not that new of an idea. It turns out Google Analytics keeps their raw click table in the same sort of format. And so in terms of building out Bigtable for ourselves, we figured, hey, this actually makes a lot of sense. We just have to figure out how to make it work with Segment. And to give you an idea, let's now dig into the Bigtable architecture. So Bigtable, the paper, was released in 2006. And it talks about a distributed storage system for structured data. Effectively, you can think about it as kind of a big key value store where all of the keys themselves are sorted. So if you want to get little bits of data or maybe a range of keys, you're able to do it. Under the hood, it looks something like this. We typically have a client which is making queries to individual big table nodes. Each of those big table nodes are keeping an in-memory data structure that they call a mem table which you can think of as a sorted list of keys and values that are append only, that then it also backs on associated Google file system tablets. These are the storage layer where we're assured that we're persisting the data to make sure that in case there's some sort of crash or an instinct throws away, that that data is still replicated and is still durable. Here's what happens when we issue a write. First, that write gets directed to the right big table node via some sort of master lookup table, uh, kind of like Chubby or another lock service. And then it actually gets appended to the in-memory data structure on the node itself before being backed or appended to the backing storage as well. What this means is that writes are really fast. They end up being these fast appends that don't require a lot of locking and you can write extremely quickly. But then they're mirrored by the underlying storage infrastructure. Read, similarly, can also be fast. Let's say we want to read a new key. If it's in our in-memory data structure, which we can filter for based upon using a Bloom filter, we can probabilistically detect that it's there and then run a lookup in memory to get a result that's really quick. If that's the case, then we just pass back the value from that node and we get a very quick read, especially if the locality is good. If we've written the value recently, then chances are it's probably still in memory. If not, we actually fetch that offset from the backing storage hardware, and then we can get it back. Now, in this case, reads first cache, and then they get merged together. So our write path is super fast, but our read path is pretty quick too, because it's coming from memory most of the time, and then it's just merging whatever the diffs are together. You might be thinking, though, uh, what about if there's an underlying failure? What if one of these nodes goes down? Well, in that case, we're okay too. Let's say we say, have the same read path, which is fetching data from our backing storage, and this node dies. Well, because we've separated compute from the underlying storage, we're able now just to move those portions onto a new big table node and claim that it now has ownership. And now we're able to just read that same data, which goes to the same underlying storage and get it back. And those are the things that make Bigtable work really well for our use case. It's multi-tenant, it's row-oriented, it uses a log-structured merge tree under the hood to ensure that there's fast reads and writes, it has immutable in-memory caching, and it does a lot of different tricks to make sure that at an individual node level, it's saving us both on reads and writes. 
Now let's talk about how it comes to our data model, how segment data fits into here. Remember I said before that this is used to query data about individual users. So we actually keep separate datas, separate data tables for each data type. We have one for records, letting us know who the user is. We have one for properties, giving us various traits about them. And we have one for events, actually storing raw event payloads if we want to pass those back to the front end. The keys are typically ID and time ordered so that we're able to get a range. Let's say, give me the events that happened in the past five minutes. And the values are snappy encoded so that if we want to pull them, we can do so quickly and efficiently. And in particular, when we stitch these together, we keep different tables for different read and write profiles. So we'll actually use different ones depending on what sort of query patterns we have. I'd like to wrap up by sharing a little bit about how this has gone for us in production. In production today with Cloud Bigtable, we're currently writing 55,000 rows per second and reading uh, a little north of 3x that. We're storing 10 terabytes of data in this system and it's all being powered by 16 different nodes. You can see here that we're describing all of it within Terraform. So if we need to make a change, we can do so quickly and easily. For BigQuery, we're running hundreds of queries per minute. This is a lot less than the big table throughput because it's not designed to be real time. It's only for a small subset of users creating aggregate pieces of data on top of their individual user profiles. Here we're scanning gigabytes of data per minute and we're storing 500 terabytes worth of data overall. But let's get back to that hard choice. If we're choosing between different clouds, I think BigQuery is just straight up hard to compare. There aren't many other clouds off there which offer the same sort of multi-tenant, heavily battle-tested infrastructure that BigQuery does. It's able to give you large amounts of data querying in incredibly quick query times. And to my knowledge, there isn't anything out there with maybe the possible exception of Snowflake uh, that even comes close when it comes to actually using this data. But when we look at Bigtable, there are actually a few more alternatives out there which seem to exist. You could use Dynamo, you could host your own sort of foundation DB setup, kind of whatever it is. There are a few different places where Bigtable actually really shines for us. Now, when we first started, we ended up using Dynamo. And we kept running into problems that made it really, really hard to work with, uh, particularly around scaling, cost, and identifying hotkeys. And for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, remember each Bigtable node hosts some set, subset of keys. So if we have one user who is recording a lot of data all at once, or one particular key that is sending hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of writes per second, that individual key gets really hot. It ends up being accessed far more than the rest. And finding those keys can be tricky because typically what will happen is they'll bring down the rest of your infrastructure and just slow everything down. And it's incredibly hard to figure out what happened. So when we were using Dynamo, we ended up actually emitting metrics around these hot keys and then coming up with a system to figure out where this was happening. But in Bigtable, they just gave it to us. There's an out-of-the-box tool that tells you what your read and write pattern looks like. It tells you how the keys are being accessed. And you can just go in and click and figure out which users are hurting you most. And this system is honestly invaluable for debugging because it immediately highlights where the problems are. The second one is mostly around cost. At Segment, we have a very write-heavy workload. Most of the time, we just have all these events that are coming in. And it's honestly a little bit rarer that we have users who are querying that data via our APIs. As it turns out, Bigtable is much better at splitting this data between compute and storage. And what's more, unlike some of the other solutions out there where you may be charged differently for writes and reads, for Bigtable, you're charged the exact same. You're just charged for a node. And so if we want to be writing more data than we're reading, the cost profile actually benefits us significantly because we're able to separate that compute and storage and just be charged for the raw throughput rather than anything special about our custom workload profile. So in closing, I wanted to leave you with a few thoughts. This is a segment for Sonas, powered by Bigtable and BigQuery. 
Bigtable helps us for small random reads. BigQuery is what we use for the batch operations. We're able to process billions of events, and we use a large multi-tenant architecture so that each customer's data gets their own individual tables and data sets, but that we're able to run the same compute infrastructure everywhere. This infrastructure gives us favorable read and write costs, and already we've been able to generate millions of dollars in revenue from this new product. Additionally, we have the firm knowledge that as we continue to scale and grow, many of these systems that we have underlying will change, but we know that under the hood, both BigQuery and Bigtable are able to scale out to levels far beyond what we see today. So if you're considering building your own infrastructure upon them, I'd highly recommend investing in Google for your different data stores. Thank you. <laughs>